Oregon right now, uh, just finishing up with a conference that ended this morning, actually. So uh, driving around a little bit, doing some photography and uh, pulled over to come on and uh, and do the introduction for Simon this evening. Uh, but it's actually only four o'clock here, which is great. So still got some opportunity to go out and shoot sunset and uh, do some bird photography before the light goes down. So I'm looking forward to that. But um for those of you who don't know me, uh, again, my name is Noah Buchanan. I've been working for Hunts now for a little over six years. Uh, Hunts is a New England-based photo and video retail company. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, uh, we sell everything from cameras, lenses, accessories. We have our own printing department. Uh, we have our own lab as well, so you can get prints made, you can get film developed, all of that fun stuff. Uh, we also have our own education department that does online classes. We do workshops. Uh, photo walks locally here in New England. Uh, so we do a little bit of everything, not just selling camera gear, uh, but that is definitely our bread and butter. Um, and we'll have some specials and stuff going out after the fact that I'll share with Nancy to share with all of you. Uh, so look out in your email for that. Uh, I do also want to mention that we will have some upcoming webinars. Uh, those links will be in that email as well. Uh, those are just some free webinars that we're putting on later this fall. Uh, with some of the different vendors that we work with on different brands and different companies. Um, and another thing that I will mention is I'll, I'll put a link down in the chat for this as well, uh, but I work very closely with Gary Farber. Some of you may know him. He and I kind of run the outside sales department at Hunts and work with a lot of clubs and groups and organizations all over the country. Um, and he has his own social media accounts and that's really where that's best to keep up with everything that we're doing that him and I are doing as far as birding festivals, trade shows, events, uh, virtual webinars, things along those lines. So I'll put his Instagram uh, account down in the chat. Uh, he posts a lot of stories and things, sharing all of that fun and exciting information that we have going on as well. So I did just want to mention that too, but all that will be down in the chat for you to check out. Um, but lastly, I'm just really excited that we have Simon on tonight to kick things off. Um, I've known Simon for a couple of years now. Him and I have actually done a couple of workshops together. Uh, we were teaching together at the biggest week in American birding back in May. And him and I also did a lot of teaching um, in Arizona back in August for the Tucson Audubon uh, Southeast Arizona Birding Festival. And that was really great as well. So I've gotten to work with Simon a bunch. Uh, he is a expert birder and an amazing photographer and has more information about birds and bird photography than most of us probably do. And it's just outstanding. Uh, and I love and just watching him go out and shoot and pick up on certain things. It's really remarkable. So all of you are definitely in for a treat tonight. I know you're all going to learn a lot. Um, I heard Simon talking already to one of you about bridge cameras and the P1000, uh, which is awesome. So this is going to be a great presentation. And again, just want to thank you all for coming on tonight. Uh, and thank you all for being here. But uh, Simon, I'll turn it over to you and you can go ahead and take it away. Ah, thank you, Noah. Um, yeah, I will just dive right into the slideshow. I have a bit of an intro in there. So uh, let's see, oops, uh-oh, <laughs> uh, I think it is, there we go. All right, uh, yeah, this is my micro to macro presentation. Uh, uh, I am a senior at Amundsen High School in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I have never lived anywhere else than Chicago. I really love just kind of exploring everything that the Chicago land uh, nature scene has to offer. Um, I am a budding conservationist and naturalist. I used to really only enjoy uh, the birds that the and where where my travels took me, um, but now I I enjoy all the plants and all the the butterflies and the bugs and everything else, um, and uh, just a little bit I documented over five thousand species of living things in the last five ish years, um, many of which are birds, many of which are plants, many of which are insects and all these other cool things that I find flying around or under rocks or whatever. Um, I also do a lot of wildlife art. Um, I will sit and draw most nights. I'm currently working on the field notebook and uh, illustration element for the uh, American Birding Association's Young Birder of the Year uh, competition. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, if you would like to, um, 
you can follow me on Instagram at bird nerder. Uh, I'm, that's also, it's also my same, the same handle on iNaturalist where I post like every single photo that I take when I'm out looking for stuff. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to write that down or go and follow them right now if you'd like to. I'll, I'll leave it up for another second. But yeah, I uh, I post uh, my best my best shots or whatever I think is my best to Instagram, uh, and I I post everything that I can possibly find. I think on iNaturalist I have like thirty five thousand observations or something. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I do. I'm very busy on both of those. Um, lots, lots and lots of photos go into both of them. Uh, but yeah, a little bit of a, a history into how I got into photography. Um, I started in 2016 when I really, really got into birding. Um, and at that point, I was really only taking photos of birds just to prove I'd seen them. So as you can see here, they're not really like well thought out. Um, these are all really, really cool birds, just kind of really not the greatest photos of them, just because I was like, oh, I saw it. Cool. We're done. We're done. We can go on to the next bird. Um, after 2018, uh, I, I started thinking a little bit more about composition, uh, really thinking about taking a photo that wasn't just like showing I saw the bird, thinking about like maybe just finding um, something interesting about the scene or whatever. Uh, still not the greatest photos, but a little bit better than what I've been doing for like the last, well, gosh, three and a half years. Uh, in 2020, um, during the pandemic, uh, when everyone else was um, in lockdown and we were, well, when we were all in lockdown, um, I was really like having the time of my life because I could go out birding almost at every chance I got because, you know, social distancing, no one else was. But my camera broke in September. So right during the middle of fall rarity season, I didn't have a camera to take photos of all the really cool rare birds that I saw, like a purple gallinule sitting in a tree on the uh, Lake Michigan lakefront and a Pacific loon and stuff like that. So I just had to take photos uh, with my little iPhone 6 through my binoculars. So really nothing great came out of that. Uh, after a couple months, I was like, okay, I can't, I can't keep doing this. I need to get a camera. So I upgraded. I had been using the P900, the Nikon P900 for all those years. So I upgraded to the P1000. Um, and here is just a little, because I use the P1000 and that's what I've been using for two years now. Uh, I really, I really know the camera. Well, I have a, I have a bit of a list of pros and cons. Uh, the pros are that it's extremely easy to use just as almost all of these uh, bridge cameras uh, has a large grip, like a full size DSLR. So it isn't something really small um, that that's kind of hard to hold. It's, it fits very well in anyone's hand, really. Uh, it's very lightweight. I think it weighs three pounds. I'm pretty sure if even that much, I'm really not sure. It is incredibly lightweight. Um, it's really easy for walking around a lot stuff like that. Um, because it is, 24 to 3000 millimeter uh, zoom range, 125 times uh, digital zoom. Uh, it's really easy to go from like telephoto to macro and wide angle um, with the camera. Uh, it's very durable. <laughs> I have accidentally closed it in a few doors. It's been hit on some rocks and even <laughs> partially submerged <laughs> in a lake. Um, but it it has never never once failed me uh, mechanically in in working really, um, uh, or at least in it's it's it has survived through many things. Uh, another really helpful thing is that it has the three axis LCD screen, uh, which means that you can kind of flip it out, and if you don't want to lay down in dirt or mud or in grass, or if you just don't want to lay down, you can kneel down and use the screen that pops out. To, uh, to take your shots and focus that way. Uh, another, I think my favorite part about this camera is the functional manual focus. So many point and shoots don't have functional manual focus, um, which especially when you've got like birds that are sitting like buried in a bush and it just can't seem to focus on it or you've got uh, or you've got something that you want to uh, focus on a certain part of and your camera just can't do it because uh, the autofocus isn't doing what you want it to. 
the functional manual focus is just it, it's it's my it's my favorite part. Um, and also the built-in flash. Uh, a lot of a lot of cameras don't have a built-in flash, uh, so the built-in flash really helps for uh, some low light and also a lot of macro uh, stuff, which you'll see a little bit later on. The cons for this particular camera uh, is the really slow autofocus speed. It isn't very nice, especially for flight shots, because it can't it can't lock on to something flying over, um, even at even at like a low um, uh, low. Uh, uh, focal length, like between between 300 and 600 millimeters, it just can't seem to lock onto anything in flight. Um, if something's kind of like if a if a shorebird's running down a beach, it really has a hard time uh, locking on to something uh, to the bird that's moving. Uh, the low quality pixels in already low res images isn't really my favorite thing. I would really have appreciated if they'd have made the the resolution a little bit higher. Uh, cause it just makes it really hard to crop your photos. Uh, I will, what I will say about that though, is that when you have like these crazy zoom ranges, you really don't need to crop if you compose your photos, how you want them. Cause you know, you could just zoom in to however, to like how you want the photo. Um, the photos become grainy after, uh, 1600 ISO, which is kind of weird considering most cameras are like after 3,200. 6400 ISO. There's a really long buffer on the highest burst setting, which is only seven shots at seven frames per second. Um, you have to wait a really long time to be able to do anything on the camera after taking seven shots. Um, your quality degrades um, after 1500 millimeters. So you've got like half your zoom range before you start to see a downgrade in your quality. Uh, the battery dies after 250 photos, which Especially if you're doing wildlife photography, it's it's really it's really frustrating when you're just sitting there enjoying taking photos of, of your of your birds and your your like even like landscapes and plants or whatever, and you're like oh died and I only got like 250 shots. It's only been an hour, um, so you have to buy a bunch of extra batteries and stuff. Uh, the zoom toggle uh, with your pointer finger it'll catch, and so sometimes you'll be sitting there wanting to like zoom in a tiny bit or zoom out a tiny bit. And it'll catch and it'll go all the way out or all the way in, um, which is just kind of frustrating. Uh, and I think my my biggest complaint is that it uses the exact same software as every other Coolpix model. Uh, so Nikon put the same exact software and the same exact chip in the $100, uh, oh gosh, the Coolpix B, it's like the B400. Um, they put the exact same chip and the exact same uh, sensor in the P1000, which you're paying a thousand dollars for. Um, and then it just kind of feels really cheaply made. The grip falls apart. Um, I, after three months of owning the camera, the, the, uh, the rubber hand grip had already started to come off. Um, and the motor mounts start to get really loose, uh, lo yeah, loose after, after a bunch of use. Um, but it, I, I can't stress enough. Like I, I've been using the camera for for two years now, and I, I I love it. It's it's perfect for for any kind of wildlife photography. It's it's just it's perfect for it. Um, if you if you're looking to just go out, turn your camera on, and get a great photo, that's that's really what I have to say about that. Um, other than the P1000, uh, uh, some other options are the Sony RX10 Mark IV. You get because it's Sony, uh, you're paying a little bit more, but you're getting much, a much higher quality uh, build for your camera. You have a little bit lower uh, on the on the telephoto end. It's still 600 millimeters. Uh, it's uh, I think $1,600 for the whole camera, whereas like a 600 millimeter lens on top of a DSLR would be many thousands of dollars. It's pretty small. Uh, it's much smaller than the P1000. Um, it's still fairly lightweight. I think it weighs just about as much as the P1000, even though it's about half the size. It also has functional manual focus. Um, my favorite part about it is the uh, the fact that Sony made a bridge camera. Uh, they they definitely designed it with the intention of it uh, being like a a DSLR. It has the ridiculously fast. I think it's the fastest of any. Um, of any camera has some of the fastest autofocus 
um, because Sony just has done it right. It has a lot of autofocus points that you can really choose. There's a lot that you can do. It has autofocus tracking, which is something that a lot of uh, British cameras don't have. And you can shoot at 24 frames per second for 330 some shots. Uh, and then the other that I have here is the Canon PowerShot SX540 HS. It is the smallest out of the out of these three that I would consider to be some of the best options to to go for. Um, as you can see from the photo, it's sitting in comfortably in the palm of someone's hand. Uh, you get a pretty you get a fairly good quality sensor. You have uh, on the high end, you have twelve hundred millimeters of zoom. It's small, it's easy to use, and you have a built-in flash. Uh, I know that a lot of my friends that use this camera are putting out like images that are just ridiculously good because um, yeah, it's a it's a, another very, very good camera. And then here, if you'd like to write these down, here's a, a quick little list of some options that are all really good point shoots that you can buy if you're in the market for one. Um, these are all either cameras that I have used myself, my friends have used, and I can see that they're getting great images or that um, I have seen people using out in the field and then I'll go and I'll look and they're taking some really, really great images. Uh, and then just a really quick example uh, for the for the RX10, I think it might be my, it's definitely at the, it's definitely number one for image quality of any point and shoot that I can think of. Here's a an uncropped image at 600 millimeters and here it is cropped to the bird being full in the frame, still perfectly sharp. It's amazing. And uh, yeah, now for the, I think I have four parts to this. Um, and I start out with the macro, the low end of the zoom range. I, I feel like the title micro to macro could really um, be used for either telephoto or um, or uh, like wider. So I, I specify with low end of the zoom range. Um, some things to remember, uh, like I've mentioned, many point shoots with functional manual focus will allow you to zoom farther in on your subjects to focus clearly. Uh, that's because the computer in the actual camera um, can't really, it can't determine the distance of what you're shooting and it can't, um, it just, it just can't like do that. The computer just can't, uh, compute it. Um, so if you override it and go to manual focus, you can definitely zoom in a little bit farther and focus clearly while still keeping your um, like minimum focus distance uh, in, in mind. Uh, focus peaking, which a lot, especially a lot of the newer ones, newer bridge cameras helps you see exactly how much is in focus and where. So especially when you're doing uh, macro or wide angle stuff, it's really, really helpful to be able to see using the highlighted area of the camera like telling you this is what is in focus but with using focus peaking that's really helpful to use your advantage um casting shadows by getting too close to your subject can throw off the whole photo um so like using like remembering that you have these zoom capabilities and not just going to the very very low end to like your 20 or 24 whatever the camera might have uh, and finding that sweet spot for the shot that you want so that you don't cast weird shadows and then just don't afraid to get uh, don't be afraid to get low uh, a lot of a lot of things that you might be getting a, a macro or a wide angle shot of are going to be fairly low to the ground um, so yeah just uh, getting getting a little bit dirty is uh, is always is always something to keep in mind but yeah um, I'll start it off with an eastern giant swallowtail um, I think most if not all of these slides, just uh, it's got the name, it's got a little bit about it um, and the settings for each of the photos shown. Um, so you can you can kind of see if you're if you're interested in getting a similar photo, you can kind of take note of the stuff. Um, but yeah, um, these two shots are a perfect example of where the built-in flash were really, uh, they really came in handy in a cloud on a cloudy day. Um, where the forest still leaves everywhere. It's really dark. It was pretty dark. Uh, the flash really helped with just kind of illuminating all the really intricate details uh, on, on these caterpillars. And then on the right photo where it's, uh, where it's a full on wide angle, um, it really helped. There's a lot of, a lot of these cameras have um, different ways that the flash is used so you can kind of play around with that and figure out what's going to work best for keeping your subject like just your subject illuminated and then everything else just kind of a 
uh, less distracting. Um, another two, these are two more examples of where flash, the built-in flash are really handy. Um, you can go from zooming way in and getting a, getting a, a very, very zoomed in shot of your subject that could be a newt like this. And then you can also get one, um, a, any, any kind of shot that keeps it uh, a little bit smaller in frame. Uh, again, just kind of, I, th I, I think a common theme for, for most of these is just kind of showing the, uh, how you can go from it filling your subject, filling the frame to, um, being a little bit, it's still being the main, the main attraction in the photo, but just taking up a little bit less space. And that's something that's really incredible with these cameras, considering the fact, or just keeping, keeping in mind the fact that it's all one piece. So you can really go from filling the frame with your subject to keeping it um, and filling in a little bit of uh, the surrounding details. Um, yeah, and then with moving subjects, especially like like uh, snakes like this, um, sometimes it can be a little bit harder, um, like I said, to, to lock on with, with uh, keeping, keeping something in, moving in focus, especially when you're zoomed in so far. Um, on something that's so close. Um, and then at that point, um, sometimes it's just up to the total luck of getting of getting uh, the the shot that you're looking for. Um, yeah, and then um playing around with I, I think uh, most of these are are examples of how really helpful the the built-in flashes are. Um, yeah, this is a a nice little this was I don't think this was at nighttime either. Um, it was in the afternoon, but um, it's it's kind of amazing how it turned a uh, completely a carpeted deck. It was like it was a weird like green carpet deck, and it just turned it totally black, um, which is which is uh, which is pretty cool for the Prometheus silk moth. And then um, this is this photo is a really good example of how. It, it kind of even even though the photo itself doesn't show it, um, the the story behind it just kind of shows how amazing it is to have such a lightweight camera. Um, I had to shoot this one handed because the the frog was sitting on my thumb, and so I basically just I held I held the camera up because it's so lightweight. Um, it was it was really no bother uh, keeping it. Um, completely steady, uh, resting on the edge of my thumb and also still focusing. Um, another thing that's really helpful because the cameras are typically smaller, um, you can use, you can, for a, for a shot like this where you're shooting one-handed, a lot of the time you can actually use your middle finger or your ring finger to focus if you have manual focus, which is really helpful. Um, but yeah, just having a camera that's so lightweight really makes shots like this just insanely easy to get uh, without having like someone else have to like hold the camera for you or uh, have to focus for you, which is really helpful. Um, here's a just a little example of um, keeping keeping other details in mind. Um, especially looking at the right photo, you can see there's a lot going on. The snake looks, it has the exact same color palette as the rocks and the crevice it's sitting in. There's a water droplet that's like almost hitting the other water. Um, and so just kind of like, like I, I, sometimes I, some, some thing that I tend to forget a lot of the time is that I have this like crazy range of zoom that I can use just that's like at my, at my disposal. So you don't always have to go for, um, like the super zoomed in or the super zoomed out, uh, just finding like the, the really happy, happy medium is always, and always like keeping, keeping your entire subject in frame is, is always important. As you can see with the, with the photo on the left, it's a little bit weirdly shaped, like the actual position of the water snake is a little bit odd, uh, but keeping, keeping the whole thing in the frame, at least for me, was, was pretty important. Um, yeah, just, uh, I think this was also another example of a one-handed shot. I was like half hanging off the edge of a, of a boulder, which was over water. <laughs> and so I really didn't want to fall. So I was holding onto a tree and I just kind of, I held my camera all the way out like this. And I kind of hoped that I got the shot that I, that I wanted. 
Um, yeah, and yeah, I think that's that's pretty much that for that. Um, when it comes to flower photography, I know there's like so many intricate details that you want to like encapsulate with your with your with whatever your subject is. Um, and then also really thinking about your background. So you can like with something that that like is not going to move like a like a flower or a plant uh, and you have you have some other like distractions that are in the way you can like go and like move them around and make it so that like you have the background that you want you have the foreground that you want um and uh yeah you can kind of see the the really like warm green background is a is a product of haze from from wildfires from out west that was blowing in and so the, the afternoon sun was like really oddly yellow um so yeah, the kind of warm tones to this photo are just kind of nice. And then one thing that's interesting about bridge cameras is that, um, and, and even even with with any with with any um, macro photography that you'll do, if you have a large subject and you want to capture small details, um, there's like a bit of a there's trade offs that you have to make. So. What's really helpful about bridge cameras is that it's really easy to like think about your trade-offs, but also just like play around and get everything that you want. You don't have to switch out lenses. You don't have to have anything extra. You can go from zoomed in on the head of, of whatever you're looking at to keeping the tail in and keeping the entire body in. And you could just get that all and then decide later on what you want. And you don't have to, you don't have to really move around. You could just stay sitting down and you got your thing right in front of you and you don't have to do anything extra. So in summary, um, I, I'm sure that uh, with, all the, with all the specs you noticed in, that the shutter speeds I was using were pretty low. Uh, with macro, your subjects aren't gonna be moving around a whole lot. There are some exceptions, of course, um, but keeping a, a low shutter speed means you can keep your ISO lower, which means that your photos won't be too grainy. Um, for wide angle, like habitat shots like you kind of saw with the giant swallowtail caterpillar um, and a few other uh, photos in there, like the, like the newt, um, keeping your aperture closed in to keep more background details is sometimes good. Like having a really clean background is, is, uh, is always really nice. But if you're trying to get a wide angle that incorporates habitat, keeping your aperture closed keeps those background details in and accentuates the photo. Uh, for and then just vice versa for close-up details, keeping your aperture wide open uh, to blur distractions is is always uh, is always the move. And then uh, I think uh, this is a, a common theme is to like attempt to eliminate possible distractions. So say you've got a um, well, what was the one that I had? Um, oh yeah, like with the Michigan lily, um, the orange flower from a couple slides ago. Um, there were some blades of grass that were kind of in the way, just as distractions, as lines going through the photo. And I was like, well, you know, I can just move them out of the way. I can just like tuck them, tuck them down. And then that that was easy. Um, yeah. And then if you'd like to just kind of take a note at the bottom of the screen, I have uh, the kind of like general range that I personally use um, in, when, when I'm doing uh, the kind of like low end of the zoom range, so between 24 and around 200 millimeters. Um, so yeah, take, feel free to, to take a note of that if you'd like, take a photo or anything, screenshot, doesn't really matter. Um, next, uh, I have the small and frame concept. It's a it's a really 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 fun thing to play around with. It's been it's been revolutionized by some incredible photographers like Ray Hennessy, uh, Dorian Anderson, and and all these other guys are are really revolutionizing the idea of keeping your subject um, as the main focus of the photo, but also like getting everything else that's happening, like really really like playing into like the actual art of of photography. Um, so. This is this is a, a nice example uh, with sandhill cranes. Uh, they migrate by the hundreds of thousands through through Indiana, right past Chicago, um, where I live. And so my my family and I will take a trip at, down in November every year to this place, and we'll see tens of thousands of cranes. Usually, there's a nice sunset, um, and you just kind of I'll sometimes think about getting. Uh, 
the sheer numbers, and I know that this photo doesn't show the tens of thousands, um, but it shows nice motion blur uh, from the cranes in front. They were flying faster than the cranes that I had my settings right for, uh, which you can see they're just below um, the the cranes that are in focus. Um, and yeah, just like the the crazy sunset colors with the condensation trail from a plane that had just flown by, all really interesting stuff. Um, with with uh, and then I I I uh, I've already talked about this, but um, with how light these cameras are, it makes it really really you feel a little bit better. And also with the with the rotational screens, um, it makes you feel a little bit better about kind of holding holding your your camera with one hand or or even with with two hands, but out over like water, say. So for these, I, I was holding my camera out. I mean, if this is Lake Michigan right here. I was holding my my camera over over the water to get these these shots here, um, but yeah, it was uh, it's always it's always really really nice to be able to to get super low without having a floating blind, without having to get in the water or anything, just because it's so lightweight. I can make small adjustments because every like your zoom is with your forefinger, so you can just easily get that done. Um, there's the mergansers. Um, this and then I, I mean, this, this is, this is nothing you can really prepare for. It's, it's all luck. Uh, when you're on a, when you're on a boat in a Louisiana Cypress swamp and you've got your family with you and they're all like tossing around cause no one's ever seen an Anhinga before. And, uh, everyone's super excited that we've just seen one. Um, and I was like, you know what, I'm not gonna be able to get a super zoomed in shot. I'm not gonna be able to get the shot that I want. So I, I literally just held my camera out and hoped I got something and I feel like at the time I was kind of disappointed that I wasn't getting like actual like decent shots of the bird like it like fully in frame but this right here is almost like a, it's almost like a hide and seek um with like the bone gray Spanish moss and um the anhinga just kind of poking out from behind the tree so yeah, that's that's kind of perfect. Like if you if you're in a circumstance where you can't get a telephoto, you just zoom out and hope you get something else. Um, which bridge cameras make that really easy. Um, this is a small in frame, but also just kind of because I I do realize that with this particular photo, the camouflage of the rattlesnake itself was like so great that it's kind of hard to see in the photo. Um, so I did add the the uh, the close up I got of it, um, but yeah, the, this this photo like shows so much. You can see the snake with the the gravel that it's going to have to like climb over to get into the grass, and you can see a literal monsoon rolling in in the top. You can like see the the wall of rain slowly moving in. Um, so yeah, just like I mean, obviously like, with any kind of photography at all, just like keeping keeping like the story element of your photo is always really something to think about. Um, but yeah, uh, vertical is something I haven't really talked a whole lot about. I know that in the Merganser slide, those were, or at least one of those was, was a vertical shot. Um, it's really, it's really, really helpful to be able to get vertical, um, macro and wide angle shots, uh, of stuff like that. And also using your, your, uh, various focus points. I know that a lot of, um, and also a lot of, uh, point and shoot cameras, uh because they don't have either autofocus tracking or continuous autofocus i know a lot of them don't have continuous autofocus you can uh say like you keep your your subject and you focus on it in the center of the frame and then you flip your camera to vertical while still like holding either autofocus lock or just you're staying half pressed to keep that in focus it the camera will lock on to that focus point so you can move it around and then make sure that you're not like losing focus and it'll keep that in focus so i didn't have to move my focus point for this at all or um, for the shot on the left at all i just kind of locked on it right at the beginning moved around and there it was um this is probably at least for small and friend this is like as small as i'll go just because the bird is a little bit hard to see and it isn't the center focus um i just thought that um the the crazy like rugged mountain peaks in in arizona with the roadrunner it's it's almost interesting to see thinking about like the composition of this like a roadrunner you think of it being like a, a desert thing not like a 
lush green mountain in the middle of Arizona kind of thing. So yeah, that's just a little thing to think about. Um, and it, like I, at, at this point, I'm just kind of giving a bunch of examples of, of photos I've taken that show the like the the range of keeping things uh, either small in frame or just the low end of, of your of your zoom. So Avocets, just tons and tons and tons of birds. Um, kind of keeping like these these like layers of color. Uh, at least in this particular photo, was really was really interesting. So there's the green grass, the blue water, the the line of Avocets, the yellow grasses, and then the reddish mountains in the back. Um, very very linear. Um, something that was just kind of interesting at that time. So yeah, uh, in summary for um, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, small in frame. Um, keeping, your, keeping your subject the primary focus, like in, ensuring that, that whatever you're shooting is still the focus of your photo and not everything else, but just using everything else to add to the story of your photo. Um, so yeah, incorporating your interesting background or foreground elements, um, and thinking of them less as distractions, um, as like major distractions, but to think of them as accentuators and stuff like that. Um, and then keeping your mind open to the unexpected, like with the Enhinga, um, that was, that was like, I was trying to get the, the, uh, the telephoto shot, but it ended up not working out. And so, you know, just zoomed out cause I could, didn't have to switch lenses or anything. Cause it's all one piece. Um, and then, yeah, just again, trying to like eliminate the large distractors from the main focus, um, just like with everything else is uh, definitely something to think about. Now for the telephoto range of, uh, of bridge cameras. So here, um, it's, it's really, really, really awesome to be able to zoom in so far and most, if not all, bridge cameras uh, will let you use really wide open apertures for like really high magnification images. So, um, yeah, these were these were shot at 1100 millimeters at f, f at, with a 5.6 f-stop, which is is kind of crazy because you can you can see like how completely blurred out the backgrounds are but how finely textured the the central details are so that's really really nice uh to be able to keep a wide open aperture with at, at really high power um and then you can see here same thing uh these were a little bit lower on the end um but still a, like a, even with a with a dslr a, a 400 millimeter lens is considered to be a um considered to be a telephoto uh, lens so kind of yeah just like also uh with a lot of those they're they're set at really um i think like the like the minimum aperture is is or i guess i guess you can't really open them that wide but because point shoots are just that much <laughs> i guess they're just that much different uh you can you can zoom in and keep your your uh your apertures more just far wider open, um, which is really helpful. Um, framing, this isn't so much about like telephoto as it is just about like thinking about like another aspect of photography that makes, uh, which bridge cameras make really easy. Framing, um, especially when you're able to zoom out and zoom in and just kind of tweak your, um, tweak your magnification to whatever you want it to be um, is really helpful. So you can see I've got the, the nicely like almost cupped Parake on the left, and then like the really, really, really far zoomed in at 700 millimeters um, over on the right. And then, yeah, just um, kind of, yeah, just really thinking about, again, the crazy um, ability to keep your aperture so wide open um, at really high power. I, I don't know of many lenses that can uh, that are over like 700 millimeters that can stay open at f4 um or that even will go open at f4 so yeah it's uh it's really really easy to get these like really 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 nice blurry backgrounds and just yeah so that makes it really easy and it also makes it more fun because it's it's almost like it's at, at sometimes it's like too easy to get a really good shot um which of course then you just kind of you play around and you make it 
you make it harder for yourself uh, by doing whatever you need to do. So yeah, that's that's that. And um, then again, there's also some some instances uh, in which um, it it doesn't always do exactly what you want. So uh, the difference between keeping it open at f4 and 1200 millimeters and f4 at 600 millimeters isn't actually all that different. Um, I would chalk that up to um, the the subject itself uh, being at different distances. So I probably couldn't have focused at 1200, 1200 millimeters uh, for the shot on the right just because it would have been too close. Um, but yeah, that that like ability to be able to double my my magnification uh, and get these these two shots was pretty incredible. Uh, and then yeah, just uh, some more some more like I don't know. I I guess I just thought that these were two pretty cool shots because this was a this was this was just uh yeah kind of interesting and um. Again, uh, thinking about how close you can get at these crazy um, magnifications. Um, one one thing that comes to mind is uh, a, a Nikon lens, um, a, a 500 uh, prime lens has a minimum focus distance of 10 feet. Uh, so you have to be at least 10 feet away from whatever you're shooting uh, to be able to just focus on it, um, which, it can get kind of frustrating because with something like this, this bird was 18 inches away from me at, at some points. So I never would have been, been able to focus on it, but I could zoom out. I could get a any pretty much any shot I wanted of this bird. And when it would move far enough away that I could zoom in to these really like high power magnifications, I could pretty much just, yeah, I could, um, I could get again, like the really blurry foregrounds, the really blurry backgrounds, sharp in focus bird all that all that stuff more um more just that similar thing these are at lapham long spurs are fantastic um they're one of my uh, they're a really really sharp looking bird uh i'd never seen an adult in breeding plumage before so the the male on the right is is like was like definitely my favorite thing so i was really focusing on trying to get that um but yeah, like at, with with birds that are really like skittish, like every time someone would walk, I remember like when we were laying down in the snow, um, every time someone would walk by, um, the birds would would kind of they would either get really wary or they'd actually like flush away and they'd they'd keep moving farther away. Um, so it's really nice to be able to get these um, really 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 far zoomed in shots of birds that are skittish, stuff like that that are also pretty decent. Uh, more along the same lines of really skittish birds. These are these are white-tailed ptarmigan chicks uh, from from the alpine tundra in Colorado. Um, these are both uh, birds that were being closely watched by the uh, by the mother ptarmigan, and so it was it was kind of a miracle that at one point they were all walking around like at my feet. Um, which, yeah, at that point, I think I actually took my phone out and I started getting photos with my phone. Um, yeah, that's just, yeah. All, oh, also, I, I know that for the small and frame um, portion of this, I, I talked about like incorporating other details, um, which is also like something if you, it, like even, even if you are shooting telephoto with your, with your bridge camera, um, like and you have like so many intricate different details like like thinking about that stuff and just kind of um closing in your aperture a little bit or or opening it up or whatever you have to do or whatever you want to do um that's just something really easy to do and you can still be super far zoomed in um because the the cameras are really lenient like that uh then i i i almost like keep kind of jumping around to what i'm saying with with like distractions uh, sometimes they're unavoidable, um, but uh, when it when it makes for like like depending depending on the scenario, then it really um, it can either accentuate a photo or it can not really help it out a whole lot. But I think with like a beach and shells, shells are always actually really fun to to incorporate in photos. Um, but yeah, sometimes they can get uh, 
if they're not the main focus, if your exposure for the photo isn't set on um, anything other than your main subject, shell white shells a lot of the time, if it's bright and sunny, can get uh, kind of washed out, which isn't always the best, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And then, yeah, th this is, uh, I, I, know I, I know I said before, like keeping your, like not cutting off any parts of your subject is, is important. But then with like headshots like this, this is incredible because with birds that are so close, you can really just like, you can zoom in so far and still keep your aperture wide open if there's enough light, of course, and get these like really, really, really zoomed in headshots of birds like this, like pine grosbeaks, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> Yeah, so then in, in summary for the, the telephoto part, um, a higher shutter speed helps, um, but many bridge cameras don't do the best with these high shutter speeds uh, as the ISO range is so minimal. I know that like looking through different specs and just like through personal experience, um, a lot of a lot of bridge cameras don't go over ISO 6400, um, which really even then you, you don't need that a whole lot. Um, but if you're on auto, if you're using auto automatic settings, um, your a higher shutter speed to keep to like capture detail will raise your ISO, and therefore because the sensors are kind of small, grain, grainier photos. Which that that might be that might not that might not be an issue. Um, it just it kind of it, it depends on the camera you, you're using and what photos you want to be taking. Um, and then yeah, just again, just like eliminating possible distractions, whether that means you moving or, um, yeah, which usually it means you moving. Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, just the kind of like wrap up for that part. And then here's a couple like side by sides to show like between the low end and the high end of the zoom ranges for point shoots. The uh, all of these photos are between I think three different point and shoot cameras that I've that I've used um so there's a there's like a good a good range of uh yeah just like a good range of uh options in here so rosy finches that, that get uh tundra details and then close-ups on the birds uh dusky grouse which shows again another vertical shot that shows a little bit more of the habitat the wet riparian rocky mountain forest and then the road that it walked up to my feet on <laughs> which actually in in the photo on the on the left um if you can kind of see i uh i couldn't really there wasn't a whole lot i could do about getting a better photo than this i couldn't focus on the eye um i because the bird was so close and i like didn't want to move to scare it off so i just was like kind of half blindly shooting it so it, like focused just past the eye but that's a that's a whole that's a whole other crazy story uh yeah and then now for some non-wildlife just because like you do have such a powerful magnification uh with most if not all of these cameras so stuff like shooting the moon is is like really easy and like with on on the left you can see it's just a, a vertical shot of the oh gosh is that a waxing uh, I don't I don't know moon terms that well <laughs> um, and then on the right that's a that's a unedited there's no filters there's nothing it was a crazy blood moon um, but yeah you can see a lot of detail it's filling the frame um, yeah just because you have like these crazy high powers. And then the sun, uh, I don't really recommend shooting the sun without filters. Uh, the only times that I've done it have been in the late evening uh, when there are fires from out west that are blowing a lot of smoke and they're really, really, so this particular photo, no filters, uh, no, like nothing at all. Um, this is just like my camera pointed at the sun as it was going down. Um, but yeah, you can you can see a bunch of like sun flares and stuff on the side. Um, yeah, it's like it's it's cool that you're able to like zoom in this far, get get uh, anything like this, something with uh, sun going down behind some trees, um, sun in uh, this was also again all of these are with like crazy amounts of smoke uh, and that are really really dimming the sun, and then also just kind of playing around with them. This is also one handed. Um, yeah, I was 
using using my camera and trying to to focus on the reflect on the mirrored reflection of the sun on my phone screen but because my phone screen had so many different layers it was making a whole lot of interesting like duplicate duplicate reflections of the sun so that's just like an interesting like compositional thing that i was trying to think of for that and then sunsets sunsets are always uh are really really fun uh you can get like entire landscapes or you can get closer in like this uh yeah i think that's pretty much it yeah that's all i got well thank you simon that was really great uh one thing i forgot to mention early on is that if anybody any questions you uh would be best to put it in the chat and there is Simon here to answer them. So. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Just like, feel free to unmute. You can put them in the chat. You can, um, yeah, anything. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So nobody has, I guess you answered everybody's questions, <laughs> it appears. <clears throat> Oh, uh, Penny, yes. Um, my personal, okay, I, I kind of go between two favorites. I Because I've been using the P1000 for two years now, um, that's like tied for first as my favorite. And then my other favorite is the Sony RX10 Mark IV. Um, it's, uh, it's the camera that I was testing through Hunt. I really liked it. My mom ended up buying it. Um, and half the time she gets better shots than I do of a lot yeah. of birds. So yeah, um, those are my two favorites. The Nikon here, I can actually, I can type them in the chat if you want. Nikon P1000 and Sony RX10 or four there. So yeah, those are, uh, those are, those are my two favorites right there in, in case you were wondering. Simon, do you ever um, do birds in flight? I try. I try sometimes, <laughs> but uh, because because it is a little bit difficult to work with slow autofocus and also uh, actually like use like using manual focus to focus on a fast moving subject is just so hard to do. Um, I usually give up. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I try sometimes. Sometimes I get really lucky. Um, there's a there's an annual um, there's a there's an annual uh, winter festival kind of a thing in in Chicago that the Illinois Ornithological Society puts on called the Golf Frolic. Uh, basically, a bunch of people sign up. You can there's a there's like a boating center that stays open in the winter, and there's it's nice and heated, so you can you can go outside. You can look for gulls. You can look, and there's a there's a every year everyone kind of chips in and helps this guy buy like every loaf of like day old bread he can possibly get. So he he shows up every year with like 200 loaves of old bread that he's been collecting since the last year. Um, oh, and I uh, just throw bread out and the gulls are flying really close. So sometimes sometimes with gulls. Yeah, uh, I see there's a few other questions in here. Uh, Mark. Uh, with manual focus on the P1000, um, the, yeah, so with your, the, the, the white specks that are around your subject, um, that's, that's called focus peaking. It's a really, really, really helpful tool. And the way you use focus peaking to your advantage is when you see the most white specks around whatever you're shooting, that's when you know that what you want is in focus. So if you, if you, and when you're kind of like playing around with it, if you don't see a whole lot of white specks, then you know that what you want isn't in, in focus. When you see a lot of white specks, you know that that's when you've got what you want in focus. I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Gina, for recommending a few good places to take birds in or near Chicago. Yeah, um, oh man, there are a lot of places. Uh, here, let me get back to that and I can write, I can make a, I can make a small list and I can type it in the chat. Um, 
Carol, I'm so glad that I inspired you to get a camera. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a reasonably priced camera for beginner um the here I, i'll type to any power that's a tough concept reasonably priced yeah these are these are both about like five hundred dollars i think hmm. i think those are those are two good cameras for about five i think four or five hundred dollars i think uh let's see what's next i have tried a panasonic lumix uh my grandpa actually uses one um he he likes it he doesn't really he likes the he actually really likes the the glass quality because i'm pretty sure it's zeiss glass mm -hmm. um so it's it's really really nice um i personally am not a huge fan of the software it's really slow it's it's not the best for like a bunch of different wildlife photography. That's that's just my opinion. Otherwise, I think that the quality is really nice. Uh, my most in oh gosh, most dangerous encounters. Um, I think one of my most dangerous encounters with like when I'm when I was been out like doing photography, I I have I've like sl I I slid down a, a small cliff one time. I. I walked into a cave that had a that had a mountain lion in it one time. Oh. I oh gosh, what else? I I've like I've run into a lot of really weird people when I've been out. Uh, <laughs> a, a couple months ago, I was out doing some orchid photography, um, just just outside of Chicago, and there was a uh, I, like I there was a crazy situation where like I I, I got followed. <laughs> so yeah, lot, lots of lots of crazy. I I have so many more crazy stories that I'm just forgetting about. But yeah, lots of lots of crazy stuff that's happened. Um, um yeah. Can April, you say a little I, more about the um the lion? Uh, what was it in the cave again? The mountain lion? Yeah, I this was at this was uh in in Rocky Mountain National Park uh, a couple months ago and. We'd been my family and I. We were hiking on this one trail, trying to look for black swifts, but the nest got destroyed somehow. I have no idea how. Um, so we were we were walking, and I my my parents ended up going a little bit farther off than I did. So I was like, "Oh man, I am like I'm out of water. I have three miles left to walk downhill. I like I just need to take a break." And so like I noticed there was like a there was like a cold like draft coming out of this like crevice in the rocks. So I like scrambled up. I hopped it. I like just like hopped up over a rock into this cave, and I saw I saw a tail flick in the back of the cave, and I ran out. So I was like, <laughs> "Oh gosh, that's, oh yeah, uh, that was yeah, that was bad." Close. Yeah. <laughs> um, April. I have been a photographer. Um, I mean, I guess I guess I could say that I've been taking photos of wildlife since 2016. Um, but I really only got into like taking decent photos in like 2019. Yeah, 2019, 2020. <laughs> um, but I've also I've also like been into wildlife for as long as I can really remember. I like I I I really got into it when I was two years old. Um, so I've I've just I've like been I've been into it for for pretty much as long as i've been alive um always flipping over rocks looking for bugs or going out to museums to look at fossils and stuff like that so but yeah strictly photography just like a only a couple of years that it, that it's been yeah uh penny i would love to come to south florida uh to wakota hatchie uh yeah green k peaceful waters all those places like i i'm like i'm trying to I have I have a bunch of friends that live down there, and uh, one of my one of my best friends is going to college at, at uh, UCF. So I think I I might try and visit him sometime soon, and and maybe I'll I'll uh, make it all the way down to, to South Florida and get to the really awesome places. But otherwise, I've actually I've never been to Florida. That's the crazy thing. I've never been to Florida. You should probably wait to breeding season and things get yeah. really exciting. Yeah, yeah, that that would be that'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Definitely, get in touch with us, and we can uh, invite you to a meeting if you overlap. And 
we'll, we can give you a guided tour to any of those places as I, well. I would love that. Yeah, I mean, that'd be, that would be amazing. Yeah. Good. We'll just keep in touch. Yeah, thank you. And here, actually, one uh, before uh, somebody asked what, yeah, the, a few good places to take pictures of birds in or near Chicago. Um, <laughs> I will recommend Montrose Point. Uh, Rainbow Beach. Um, let's see, where else is good? Uh, there's like a bunch of like, kind of like little random places that are around the city. Like there, there's really nowhere that's like wide open nature that always has something good. It's just kind of, um, it's kind of random a lot of the time. Like some of the best photo ops, especially for me, have either been like, I'll be, out at a random city park looking for a rare bird and like something will pop up in front of me and I'll just get like randomly lucky. Um, other than that, thinking about places that I consistently get good photos. Hmm. Where did you see those rails? That was at a place called the Bartell Grasslands. It's a, a a really, really kind of expansive marsh and grassland uh, forest preserve. Um, and every year I would, I, I nobody sees them every year, um, but considering his, like taking into consideration historical data and also just like, like the general knowledge, my general knowledge of the habitat, um, I would assume that around 20 yellow rails migrate through um or or maybe even breed at at this at this place um yeah uh that that would um that yeah it's it's a really really fun place i'm thinking that uh you know in in chicago there's so many places like i i don't know if you've ever heard of it before but there's montrose point um, which like people rave about and stuff and in spring migration, it's really great. You can, you can go for an hour and find a hundred species like mm. easily, um, on, on pretty much any given day in May. Um, but other than that, like, I, I think there's like so many other of these like little underexplored places in Chicago that nobody goes to that, like <laughs> that all these like great birds get found. So I'm thinking that, uh, yeah, I'm thinking that that's going to, that I'm going to go back to the, the rail spot a lot next, next spring. Um, when you said expensive, what did you mean? Um, uh, oh, for, for, for like habitats. I didn't know what you meant. So what you said, uh, we mentioned Bartel grasslands, you said something about expensive. I, I, I think, think I, I think I meant expansive, just like, oh, okay. um, <laughs> like it, it's a, it's like a, cause you know, Chicago is, um, Oh gosh, how many acres? I okay. So I, I know I know the the, the stat. There's eleven percent of of Chicago is um, protected by mm -hmm. either the Parks District or the Forest Preserve District. And sorry, uh, the yeah these these places are all really fragmented. Um, there's there's only a few like places where the like wild areas are connected and it's either along the rivers or yeah it's actually only along the rivers um there's three major rivers or not major there's three rivers that run through the chicago area um and most of the preserves um that that you can go and find birds at fall like bordering these rivers um so yeah there's just nowhere expansive that you can go and like find a whole lot, but you know, you find the small places and you find the good stuff. Is Bartel outside of Chicago? Just outside, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's a maybe ten miles, fifteen miles outside of the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so somebody put in the uh, the chat a whole bunch of more places that. You would want to go if you came to Florida. Oh yeah, and they oh, all. Oh yeah, the alligator places. farm. 
Yeah, and actually it's a really neat place. And yeah, it's during totally breeding cool. season because it's also a um, place where birds go to breed. Mm. And it, it sort of naturally happened. They have an amazing amount of alligators, mm-hmm. huge to young, mm-hmm. and they have an unbelievable concentration of breeding birds during breeding mm-hmm. season. And they're That's close awesome. up. I mean, it's it's really neat place. Yeah, that's awesome. And then we have a lot of other neat places too. So, yeah. Cool. I have to spend a while down here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, between between like the Everglades and Sanibel and like the pine the pine wood forest up north. I wouldn't count Sanibel right now anymore. Oh, yeah, that's right. The hurricane took it out. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're a little luckier right now on the on the the east coast so yeah yeah at the moment I mean, there is one place that i love out on the west coast but i don't know how hard it would be to get to fort myers mm, yeah fort, I, 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 not fort myers fort de soto fort myers is oh. like hit really bad but yeah fort de yeah. soto is a really great place hmm. and supposedly they're in good shape but okay not sure what you have to do to get through to them because a lot of places around were flooded because of the hurricane. Right. But keep in touch and we'll let you know when things are really good. Yeah, yeah. So anybody else have any more questions? Oh, I did miss a, I did miss a question up here. Uh, Sherry, I would, when I... Oh man, after after college, I have no oh, idea. Question. <laughs> I have no idea what I want to do. Uh, I'd like to study um, fish, wildlife, and conservation biology at Colorado State University. That's that's what I'd like to study in college. But after that, like there are so many things that I could do. There are so many things that I might do that I might not necessarily want to do. Um, <laughs> just just to like have a job, you know. But I would ultimately like to do something related to either like I, I I just like I need to be like out in the field like doing field work so whatever it is like if it's doing bird or plant surveys if it's doing like any kind of like banding research just any anything anything that keeps me out in nature pretty much they've got yeah, a number who knows? Yeah, who knows what that's going to end up being. Yeah. It, uh, you go in thinking one thing and sometimes you come out something yeah. else. So yeah. You never know. I'm sure it'll yeah. be related one way or the other to nature and the outdoors. Yeah. So um, let's see. A few mentions to the group here. Uh, next month, obviously, we, we have another presenter, I believe. It was a little mix up with the date. So we're going to try to get that straightened out. Um, let's see what else. We do have an idea that we'd love your feedback. See if you would be interested. We were thinking of maybe what inspired us actually was the um, bird of the month that Audubon Everglades does at each of their meetings, which I think is really neat. So I was thinking, and it's just something I'm gonna throw out there, is maybe we could have different people pick a topic of something that they've photographed, a bird or location or something special, nature, and take maybe five minutes before our presentation starts and do just a little informative presentation with their photos. And we would have just one person do it for each of the meetings. So if anybody is interested in doing something like that, please let me know. And you can put it in the chat or you can just email it to Audubon Everglades. I'm not sure of the address, but it, I think we have the email address on our uh, website. And I think that is it for tonight. Thanks, Simon. You did great answering so many questions. <laughs> Thank you. Very well. We appreciate it. And I guess we can say good night. So yeah, thank you so much. 
Yeah. yeah. Wonderful time. And thank yeah. you everybody for attending. And hopefully everybody enjoyed it. And I want to make sure we have no more questions. Your natural inspiration to other young people. That's sweet. Sounds good. You don't have a website. Maybe I'll start thinking about it. Okay. Excellent presentation. Whatever you do, you will be outstanding in your field. <laughs> okay. So much for a great. So wonderful. So you take care, Simon. It was a pleasure having you with us. And I think we're going to say good night. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for listening, too. Yeah. And we are thankful, too. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.